Hi, my name is Carla Ramsdale, and I teach in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at Appalachian State University. I am here in the middle of Boone in uh, this beautiful September day in the Appalachian Mountains, and I'm going to do a little demonstration about solar cooking. Uh, first, a little bit of background about myself. I came into higher education as um, a second career. I am um, a registered professional mechanical engineer, and I worked in the electricity power generation uh, sector for a long period of time, and then came into higher education. So it seemed natural that I would just start teaching about energy, which is what I did. So I teach courses on energy and sustainability. But I noticed that um, I'm Italian, and so food is a huge part of who I am and my upbringing. And I recognize that when I interjected comments about food into my classroom, for example, talking about specific heat, and I see this sea of students somewhat engaged, and then I mention, well, that's why we use um, a stone, and that's why a pizza cooked on a stone comes out so much crispier. All of a sudden, I would recognize that all of my students immediately are looking at me and engaged and asking their neighbors, wait, what did she just say? I think that was important. And so I, I recognize that introducing food into physics and into this discussion about sustainability was a fantastic way to engage people. Uh, so then, as I started doing more research uh, about physics and food, I recognized that this is an energy source that I believe is underrepresented in our energy efficient discussions. Food is energy, and how we how we manipulate it is uh, really important and is one of the big drivers in climate change currently. So now my work is all about uh, the physics of food and the thermodynamics, studying the energy of the food system. And I take a really broad, broad look at it from what foods we choose to grow and then how we process them, how we package them, which is a big deal, and then how we transport them and refrigerate or freeze them. And then the fun part happens when it gets into our homes. So how we, how we cook it, what skillets we use, for example. My latest research project uh, studied eight different skillet materials from a $200 solid copper pan to a humble $15 cast iron skillet. And we used infrared thermography to try to dictate what is the most sustainable skillet, both based on thermal properties and some non-thermal properties. So, um, so yeah, we cook in our home. We look at different types of ovens and talk about refrigeration. And then the final step of my work is looking at the disposal side of things and how we're responsibly uh, getting rid of things and recycling the packaging and what have you. So, so that's the broad search. I teach courses. I teach a first year seminar class on the physics of energy efficient cooking. I teach the general physics series, which I introduce some food into. I teach this course on energy and sustainability. And then also I teach a course dedicated to the physics of food and cooking. So, uh, so as we said, we're going we're gonna to talk specifically about how to cook with the sun. Right? So when we're in our, in our kitchens, we can talk about efficient ovens, but still they have either fuel or electricity coming into them somehow. On a beautiful day like today, we have about 1,000 watts of solar energy incident upon the Earth every square meter. And that's a pretty significant amount of energy. So a lot of people obviously are engaged in this topic of how can we use that to cook for us. And uh, so there's a lot of really creative solutions uh, that we'll talk about. And we'll get into the physics. But before that point, I thought maybe it was a good idea to go ahead and just start cooking so that the food can cook while we're describing the physics. All right, I decided to stay really pretty simple here. So first of all, we're gonna cook um, some potatoes and peppers. This is a good chance to pause and talk about how we source our food, right? How we get this energy source. Um, and so all this, all these beautiful uh, uh, potatoes and peppers, except for these two white ones, uh, came from the High Country Food Hub. So this is an amazing resource we have here in Watauga County. It's an online farmer's market. All the food is grown locally. Um, and so obviously, we have this uh, real benefit in that we um, reduce transportation energy. That's a, a super critical part of a local food system. But there's also a lot of other factors that may even be more important than just the reduction in transportation. Um, we also, we don't package them. So this was from Daffodil Spring Farms in Valley Cruces, and they choose to package their potatoes, right, in a little simple uh, paper bag, which will biodegrade really simply. So uh, if we put that in contrast, to how we may uh, 
buy a potato in a grocery store in a plastic mesh bag that will take 100 years to degrade. So, so packaging is a big uh, uh, advantage of choosing some local food. Um, we have to kind of challenge ourselves and be okay with food that's maybe not as beautiful as um, what we buy in the grocery store, right? So we waste 40% of the food that's grown in the United States never gets eaten. Uh, a lot of the times it just stays in the field because the farmer chooses that it's not pretty enough for us to purchase. And so, you know, it's okay. I kind of like food with a little bit of personality personally, but uh, that's a way to recover an enormous amount of energy because we've grown that food and then just to let it rot seems like an incredible waste. I'm gonna stop talking because this is loud. All right, so we're just gonna add a little bit of olive oil to that because, you know, pretty much anything tastes better when you put some olive oil on it. Uh, we're also gonna add a little sprinkle of salt. And a couple herbs also may be a good choice. So we have, you know, choices here as well. I harvested these herbs this morning from my porch, right? So rather than buying herbs in a bunch of plastic packaging, uh, this makes uh, a really easy crop we can all grow at home and these little scissors make uh, chopping these things really super easy. I do wish you were all here and live so we could do some tasting at the end of this cooking demonstration. I'll let you know how it tastes. Okay, perfect. So uh, that's one of our uh, one of the things we're making. The other thing is already uh, made so I uh, also was going to cook some Burgers. Um, and so uh, if we uh, look at this graph, it's a good time to talk about the impact of our food choices on our greenhouse gas emissions. So this graph is issued by Environmental Working Group, and it shows the range of um, our greenhouse gas emissions <clears throat> based on different food sources. So we see beef is all the way over on the left here with uh, many kilograms of equivalent carbon dioxide emissions. And then we see on the right-hand side, we have lentils and a lot of our dry beans and legumes. So the further we can eat to the right-hand side of this curve, the less greenhouse gas emissions are um, emitted from our food uh, choices. So, so really good news is that lately, a couple of companies have gotten behind this plant protein concept and created some burgers that taste remarkably like um, a beef burger. So Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger right now are the two companies. So I was going to go ahead and just cook some Impossible Burgers today so we can see exactly what those look like and I will tell you what they taste like. <laughs> uh, if you haven't tried these yet, I would encourage you to do so. They actually serve them at Burger King right now. Uh, the Impossible Burger is available there, but you also can buy them in almost any grocery store and they come in a in both a ground beef option and also a sausage option. So, so these have about 90% less greenhouse gas emissions than their beef counterpart. And so um, that just makes sense. We're talking about managing this energy source. Um, we could eat corn ourselves, right? And we'll get all the energy from that corn. But instead, if we feed corn to a cow, which we probably shouldn't anyway, because cows aren't supposed to eat corn, but if we did, only about 10% of it is converted into the cow's meat that we may then consume. So we've had a 90% reduction in the available energy of that initial food source uh, because the cow had to do all the things a cow does, right? Like live and whatever, so, and breathe and move. And so, um, so yeah, the, the lower down on the food chain we eat, the better we will be. Um, as far as our energy um, conservation. Okay, so I think we're ready. We're gonna go ahead and load our ovens. We're gonna put two burgers in each oven and then also these uh, potatoes and peppers. I'm gonna split this in about half. We're gonna talk about the different kinds of ovens that I'm using here in a moment, but again, I'm just gonna load these up. Unfortunately, we have had a cloud show up on our cooking scene. That's unfortunate, but that's okay. We'll see if we can pull it off anyway. So half of them are gonna go in this uh, evacuated tube oven. This is called the GoSun Fusion. It's the latest and most advanced solar oven on the market right now. Perfect. I think that's ready to go. I'm gonna put another scoop of that in there. Okay, we're gonna just close that up and give it a good seal.
And then we're going to go over here to our box oven. Okay, we want to make sure both of these ovens are focused uh, well into the sun, casting a symmetrical shadow. There's a lot of different mechanisms these ovens give us uh, so that we're sure that we're focused properly. All right, so there's our main course, but uh, no meal would be complete without a little bit of dessert. So I also made some ginger snaps ahead of time uh, that I'm gonna go ahead and cook in this evacuated tube down here. So. All right, so we're just gonna load up these ginger snaps. And, you know, just to make the meal complete, we need a little bit of coffee. And so I'm uh, additionally going to, to brew a cup of espresso in this parabolic reflector. Let's get that focused right as well. All right, so while that's all cooking, let's talk for a bit about uh, these different kinds of solar cookers. In general, solar cookers can be divided into two categories. One of them are solar ovens, right? These are things that are designated to replace the oven uh, in your home. So, um, and, and among the ovens, we have kind of two categories. So we have box ovens, which would be that one over there, the sun oven, and then also this yellow one on the ground. And then the other category would be evacuated tube ovens, and that's what we see over here. Most of these are by the company Go Sun, which is uh, definitely the leader in this kind of technology. And the other category of a solar cooker is a reflector, and that is more to replace your cooktop or range. And so we see down there um, that sole source, and also we have a couple of these uh, solar flares. Um, those are more about reflecting onto a cooking surface such as a skillet or a pan or something along that nature. And this right here, our espresso maker is also um, like that. You would normally put the espresso on the range top and so this is replacing the range top. So let's start with talking about the physics of the ovens first, right? So any of these ovens, the keys are to obviously maximize solar incoming radiation, right? We wanna to try to scoop up as much solar radiation as possible. As I mentioned, there's about a thousand watts per square meter on incident on the surface of the earth. But when you turn your oven on at home to, you know, bake at 350, it probably is about 3000 watts of power that it draws to, to accomplish that. So there's a couple things that we do to make these more effective. Um, one of them is to make the volume of the oven smaller, right? So if we don't have to heat up the 30 pounds of steel that's the oven in your home, well then that helps us, you know, and if we have a smaller volume, obviously we're trying to heat a smaller space. So you see most of these ovens are, are pretty small in space. And then the other thing we do is we try to scoop up more sun than what is just incident upon the oven itself. And as you can kind of see, that is done predominantly with reflectors or mirrors. So let's go to the physics of that just for a minute. In order to, um, to understand how these mirrors are reflecting thermal energy into this oven, uh, we are going to rely on this Nerf dart. <laughs> so if I put the Nerf dart on one of these reflectors, right, I show what is the perpendicular to this uh, reflective um, surface. And then we rely on, in physics, the law of um, reflection. And that says that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if the solar radiation is coming into this oven perpendicular to the surface, right, we can imagine that as this sun ray right here, right? So we're gonna come in sort of perpendicular to the surface and it is going to be incident upon uh, the perpendicular to the surface, to this uh, reflector. And then what we know is whatever angle this incoming beam is making with the perpendicular will be the same angle on the other side of that perpendicular. So the angle of incidence is equal to this angle of reflection, right? And so we see if this is coming in parallel, well, this guy is gonna make it into the surface. We do lose, lose a little bit of energy upon a bounce, but not much, right? And so rather than just relying on the energy hitting this glass surface, now we can scoop up a much bigger uh, space. We see the same thing happening down here with our evacuated tubes, this gets a little more complicated because we're no longer just reflecting onto a flat surface, but we want to reflect on this, um, this line here. And so what we rely on there then is a parabola. And if you don't remember from geometry, a parabola is a slice through a cone. 
And it ends up that maybe counterintuitively, if you um, have incoming radiation uh, coming in straight in sort of perpendicular to this whole oven arrangement, then the focal point off of a parabola shape will be onto a central point. If you instead chose a semicircle, well, the focal point then would be along a line, and some of the reflection from these surfaces would miss the oven completely. So it's important that all of these circular um, reflectors are based on a parabolic shape rather than a circular shape. All right, so we want to make sure that we maximize solar radiation gain. Part of that is by these reflectors. Also, uh, in the case here of this evacuated tube, this is a really fun thing uh, to talk about. So evacuated tubes, are two concentric cylinders uh, inside each other. Um, the outside is all out of borosilicate glass, which is what most of the Pyrex in your kitchen is made out of. It has very good transmissivity, which means it allows the solar radiation to pass through this outer surface very easily. Then we coat the inside cylinder with a solar selective material that is very effective at absorbing solar radiation from the Earth's um, wavelength, I mean, from the sun's emitted wavelength, right? So what we know about radiation is that the intensity of the radiation is dependent upon the body that emitted it. So the sun that has a 9800 uh, degree Fahrenheit surface temperature emits radiation that is very intense, very short wavelength. So it can make it through this outer cylinder with no problem and gets absorbed by the coating on that inner cylinder. That then warms the oven. The oven then re-emits its own radiation, right? But because the oven temperature is significantly less than the sun, it, the solar radiation it emits is at a much lower intensity. And so now, as it tries to make its way out, it's blocked by the outer glass surface, or for example, in that, in that oven, the glass top of the box, right, it gets blocked. It's the greenhouse effect. It's the same way a greenhouse works. It's why as we throw more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we have this buildup of thermal energy because the shortwave high intensity radiation can make it through without much trouble, warm the Earth's surface. But then as this longer wavelength intense radiation tries to make its way out, the greenhouse gases or glass on the oven trap it and keep it within the system, and that helps to circulate this energy and, and warm it more and more. Perfect. So, uh, so in, uh, the other thing that we, um, we do here, so while we're maximizing radiation gain, we're also trying to minimize heat loss, and heat can be lost through conduction, convection, or radiation. Um, it ends up conduction and convection both need a medium. They need something, right? So conduction is the transfer through a medium without the movement of the medium itself. And convection, we know very well today, as the wind is really blowing, is the transfer of thermal energy because of the movement of a medium, right? So as this wind blows, it's cooling me off on this sunny day, which I am appreciative of. Um, so what we do in an evacuated tube is we evacuate it. That space between the inner and outer cylinder has all of the air molecules, everything sucked out of it, removed. So there's a negative pressure between these two cylinders. It's why it has to be cylindrical because we couldn't hold that kind of a vacuum in another shape like a square. And so by doing that, by removing the molecules, we've removed the medium. So once we gain that radiation in the middle of the oven, we can't lose it by conduction and convection because there's no stuff in between these two layers to accomplish that. In the same way your, uh, your mug right, may have a, a, a vacuum sealed mug, the same thing. We're trying to block the loss due to conduction and convection. So that's really what makes these rock stars on efficiency, right? All these ovens have their pros and cons. Pretty clearly, the sun oven's advantage is its volume. You could put a cake in there. You could bake your Thanksgiving turkey if it was a small turkey, right? So it has this great big space, but it does lack an efficiency. So on a super sunny day like today, we'll probably do pretty well. But on a day that has a dapple of shade or some clouds roll in, you're, you're pretty much immediately out of luck with that kind of technology. The evacuated tube, on the other hand, one of the biggest consequences 
uh, is actually that it can get too hot on a really hot day. They're just so incredibly efficient. I've actually cooked in that one um, on a day that was rainy and I was stuck under a tent and it still got to just under 200 degrees. So they are just uh, super efficient. I'm gonna pause for a moment because I smell ginger snap. <laughs> So I'm going to check to see if we've burnt our cookies already. Yeah. So we see here we have this uh, beautifully, nicely cooked uh, ginger snap down here. One of the things about evacuated tubes is they tend to get hotter in the deep part of the oven than they do here. So we see out here we're still a bit raw, whereas down here we're pretty well cooked. Oh yeah, this smells so good. I completely wish I could be sending these good smells out to the audience right now. It's obviously hot in there, but this outside is still completely cool to the touch. So uh, we see the, the impact of the evacuation between those two layers there. Um, so I have several evacuated tubes out here. Let's just go through. Uh, the fusion is the, the latest and greatest. Um, so let me tell you another something special about the fusion. It also is about this yellow oven on the floor, and that's that they're called hybrid ovens. And that means that they uh, work with the sun, yes, but I can't tell you how many times I've been out cooking in the sun and then the really thick clouds roll in. So this also has the advantage of an electric strip. So it comes with a power cord and also you can buy uh, this, this uh, solar battery that comes with it, right? And so you uh, have an output here, a 12 volt outlet, so you can use this battery or you could use your car or an RV or a boat or whatever also. And this plugs into here, and then this plug here uh, plugs directly into the tray of the Fusion. And I'll show you when I take the food out of there, on the bottom of the Fusion, there is um, an electric resistance heater. And so that allows this space to be heated even in the absence of sun. So uh, one of the great things about the Fusion also is that you could get a solar panel and charge your battery during the day with the solar energy. And then when you come home at night, because usually dinner time is not an ideal time to solar cook, which is one of the drawbacks. But now you could actually plug your oven into this battery, which had stored solar oven, uh, solar energy for the day and then cook in the evening. So it's a brilliant uh, solution to um, both trying to augment when the sun is not really bright and also be able to cook at night. So super excited about that new technology. Um, that yellow oven on the ground is a box oven equivalent. So this is also a hybrid oven. Uh, it also comes with a plug and there is a an electric uh, heater in here. Uh, so this is a great way to show that it's important that we are designing our products really well. You see as you open this oven, however, uh, we get a significant <laughs> right, tipping. So it's a very difficult oven to cook on, but it did have the advantage of having this hybrid element, which I thought was really smart. Um, so the leader in the box oven would be this one, which is the sun oven. And uh, the way that it contains the thermal energy is by this, um, there's an inside aluminum liner, right? It's black, obviously, because any of the solar radiation that comes in, you want to make sure that you have an absorbing surface there so it can uh, heat up. You wouldn't want a reflective surface inside the oven because that short wave radiation would come through the glass and then bounce off the surface. And then since it would stay pretty high intensity short wavelength, it would just make it right back through the glass. So you wanna make sure on the inside you're putting some really dark uh, absorbing um, colors. Um, and then the outside here is just a plastic uh, surface on the outside of the oven. And between the inside aluminum and this outside plastic, there's fireplace insulation. So I could cook on this all day long and I, the outside will always be cool to the touch. So it also does a good job of, of keeping in um, that thermal energy. Okay, um, the, a couple more ovens, so many ovens. So here's a, another example of one of uh, Go Suns. This is a great example of a portable oven you could bring with you to the next barbecue while everyone else is slaving over the coals. Uh, you could just open this. So this is a, a teeny tiny, it's great for one or two people. Here's the tray, they come with these little silicon baking pans which you can choose to use or you can just go right uh, into the, the pan itself. Uh, this is actually pretty much as effective as the sport that we're using here. So really small, it has a little lock there and again, really portable, fun, great introductory to uh, solar cooking. Um, I have another example down here. This is a solar kettle. 
So that's filled with water currently, and um, it's a great way to boil water. It boils about two cups of water in about 20 minutes on a really sunny day. Again, the reflectors um, are just built in there. You see that this actually can then close all up, so you could bring that with you somewhere. And then when it's time to cook, uh, you can just open up these solar panels, and then this becomes the stand and the reflectors. Like that. Beautiful. And there's also a little, another uh, example of an evacuated tube that's really, really, really tiny. Okay. So the next category, so all these things we've been talking about are things that replace your oven. The other category of a solar cooker is um, something that would replace the range or the stovetop on your, in your kitchen. And that's kind of what these things down here are doing. They are also, um, you know, concentrated on making sure that we're grabbing a whole bunch of uh, solar radiation, um, but they're not good, obviously, at blocking conduction, convection, or radiation. So uh, the advantage is that the cooking environment is very familiar. Right, so we cook on a skillet at home anyway. All we're doing here is replacing uh, the, the, the uh, um, resistance burner or the flame with the sun. And so actually in some tests they've done in third world countries, these types of cookers had the highest adoption rate because you could genuinely kind of replace a three stone fire with this reflector and all the cookware and methodology that you sort of were used to doing culturally remain the same. So. They're not nearly as efficient, right? But um, so we have to consider all these other factors to make sure that we have uh, good, um, to make sure we have good adoption. Um, so we are gonna test uh, the temperature of the skillet here. I have an infrared uh, thermometer just to see. It's been sitting out here for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. At the focal point, uh, we see all these different ovens have different mechanisms uh, for us to make sure that we are uh, focused properly with the angle of the sun. This has this little, um, this little um, concave um, reflector here, and so we put that right at the bottom of the that reflector. And as the radiation comes in, it actually splays. Um, a bright spot on the bottom of the pan, and that shows us how we're focused. So see, as we pull this out of focus, we see that little spot that we can see on this change. So it's, it's actually like a little bit of a, of a mirror, really. That little thing acts as a mirror, so it helps us to see where the focal point is on the bottom of this pan, so we can make sure that we get it both right in tilting angle and also, so we wanna make sure both in elevation and azimuth that these uh, ovens are aligned properly. And so right there, we see from that little plastic thing there, that projection of the focal point of this on the bottom of that pan looks about perfect. It's right in the middle. So I'm gonna use this infrared thermometer. It's actually an infrared camera. So this allows us to see heat. So it allows us to see wavelengths that are a longer wavelength than the longest wavelength that our eyes can see. So the longest wavelength we can see is in the is red, and this is called an infrared camera. So it sees wavelengths that are longer than the red wavelength, and so it's really cool because uh, we can see where um, where our heat losses in our home. These are great diagnostic tools for energy efficiency. It really works well in our in our work here as well. So if we take a picture there, uh, we can see very clearly this um, white spot right in the middle shows that the pot is definitely. Uh, the hot spot. So we see right there in the middle, and that's showing a temperature right now of about 224 degrees in the middle of that pot. So clearly we could boil water there, but it would be hard to do anything like searing, right? Something you have to get to the Maillard reaction, which is about 380 degrees, that browning we get on fish or on caramelization on vegetables occurs only when we get to these higher temperatures. So I have struggled to get these reflectors um, up to temperatures to accomplish that. But certainly if I had a pot there and left it out long enough, I could see that I could, could boil. Uh, these are also um, reflectors. They're uh, intended to reflect the radiation onto these um, aluminum absorbers that are up on these trays. Um, 
obviously the least efficient of what we're talking about here. I have definitely cooked quesadillas in here so we get hot enough to melt cheese. You can make s'mores all day long. <laughs> it's enough to melt the chocolate and make the marshmallow nice and mushy, but, uh, but trying to cook um, other things becomes a challenge. Um, there are, I've, I've uh, actually done some pasta and kind of boiled pasta in there. Boiling probably is an aggressive term, but I got the water, pasta water hot enough to cook it. It took about an hour to, to cook a single serving of pasta, but um, yeah, so they actually have this, all that this uh, surrounding uh, sort of shade here is trying to do is to block convection, right, right now. So they, uh, this is the problem here is I think what we're gaining by radiation, we're losing by convection and those kind of try to surround it to avoid that. I smell the ginger snaps again. So let's hop over here and see how this goes on sport is doing oh yes potentially we have waited a little bit too long for batch number two of our ginger snaps so we definitely see we have accomplished our caramelization we spoke of earlier uh, in this oven this oven's just incredibly efficient so those are our ginger snaps that we can enjoy later and we definitely see the steam coming out of there so i'm just gonna uh, take this now out of the sun right i'm just gonna close it up and allow it to cool down some so we see that our burgers appear to be definitely browned. We see a little bit of sizzle going on down there, just like um, the uh, other evacuated tube. See, one of the drawbacks of a lot of, well, a lot of these ovens is that they really uh, retain a lot of the moisture, right? They have to be sealed up so that we're not losing a tremendous amount of thermal energy. But um, as we cook food, right, the water that's in the food vaporizes and becomes steam. And then what happens is that the steam recondenses on these surfaces. So we see in the case of a box oven that really degrades the performance because now we have this sort of uh, film of steam or condensed water there um, that is now blocking some of the incoming radiation. So I'm going to open this and allow some of that steam to escape and also check the temperature while I open it. Okay, so also I see the burgers are looking like they're coming along pretty well. We can even see a little bit of sizzle there on the edge of the burger like we did on the other one. And then the potatoes are, are on their way to cooking. Uh, one of the things that's curious to me about these ovens, these box ovens, is they open from the top, right? And I mean, heat rises or colder air sinks, right? And so uh, what ends up happening when you open these ovens particularly is that you get a huge belch of the thermal energy and it takes a while to recover that because this is at the top. I'd love a box oven manufacturer to come up with a door on the side like you have in your oven at home so you could open it and replace food without really sort of losing this enormous amount of energy. Um, the evacuated tubes, right, you open them from the side and so that does definitely help um, to not drop the temperature so significantly as you check on the food. All right, so I think we've waited a little while. We keep having sort of the clouds rolling in, so uh, we've had a little bit more of a wait than typical, but I think we're gonna go ahead and pull this food out of the oven. I just wanted to make a note uh, quickly that, you know, we've talked about the effectiveness of evacuated tubes, but I have learned that not all evacuated tubes are created equal. So for example, this uh, solar oven, I was really attracted to, right? Because it has a really nice hard outer shell. Uh, which is protective, but um, I know from outreach events that I can do cookies in um, this one, about four batches of cookies to one batch in there. So whether it's the difference in the coating or evacuation or reflectors maybe aren't parabolic enough or what have you, you just want to be cautious about that, that there's a lot of factors that have to come together for all this technology to work as well as it does. All right, so let's go ahead and open the uh, oven and see if we can do some eating, which again, I really would love to share, but I'm just gonna have to do it all myself. On a day that we weren't struggling with the sun so much, we definitely would have a little bit more browning on those. I've cooked them in here before and gotten a nice, nice browning. And then let's head over to our box oven and see how that's doing and open this up. Might be nice to take an infrared image. So we're showing about 238 degrees inside this oven right now. The vegetables also and the burgers seem to have done quite well. There we go. Let's take a taste and see what it's like. All right, so again, I wish you were here to share this with me, but I'm gonna take a little taste here and see how, how everything went. 
peppers are delicious. A little bit of this burger, we see that it did cook all the way through, we have no more pink. Mm. Really, really good. You, I would super encourage you to try these um, new burgers. Don't necessarily need to be all vegetarian. Any part of our food system that we can shift is a help. And then lastly, so one note about evacuated tubes is you have to be okay with your cookies being a little curved, which is okay because you know what? They fit in your mouth a lot better, right? Mm. Really, really good. Cooked perfectly. So thank you for joining me. Um, get out there and cook. And I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions you might have. Have a great day.